welcome to the What If series. My name is Nonze Gelelo. Today I'm with Dr. Tendai Morisa and we are talking about the big bet. Dr. Tendai, welcome. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for having me. Right, so I looked at the big bet. For those of you who don't know what it is, it's a blog that was written by Dr. Tendai that talks about engaged communities. And one of the things that really caught my attention was the tagline. You said farewell to political parties and long live engaged communities. So could you just paint a picture for us? What is the big bet? Oh, thank you. Uh, I think let's just use the big bet for a moment. Uh, we don't want to make it sound like we've got a crystal ball and I'm looking at a country to say this is what is going to happen in the future uh, based on some maybe prophetic things, yada, yada. But it's actually just based on studies, what we are seeing, what are the national trends, what are the global trends around public behavior, uh, political parties, like you said, I said, long live, engage communities, and it's a farewell to political parties. It's a bold assertion because I think, uh, and this is based on my research and also that of others, that we're beginning to see that when you really look at it, especially in a non-election year, most of our people actually not do not belong to political parties. They belong to different associational platforms or modes. So these could be your residence associations, cooperatives, savings group, churches. So this is where literally where life happens. So life really happens on those moments or around say elections or rallies, but day to day life is organized within smaller associations, the stuff that happens outside your gate. Lovely. So you talk about a utopic community or engaged community rather, and you talk about four C's that underpin the type of community that you envision for us. Could you just break those down for us? Okay, so the, I think the, the idea, well, it may sound like a utopia, but if you really look at it, uh, this is not something that we're trying to introduce. This is something that we are surfacing that is already existing within communities. Because if you go to any community uh, across Africa and you begin to try to understand how life is shaped, uh, this is from birth to death. So from birth to all the way to growing up until you die, you are actually a beneficiary of associational life. You actually, so when you are born, commu the community is going to come together to celebrate your birth. They bring gifts, they bring all sorts of things to celebrate you. Others have actually called, like my colleague Begin Cosimo, is called that philanthropy, that from birth to death, you are a beneficiary and a contributor to philanthropy. But you can broaden it to say, you are part and parcel of associational life. So that's what makes us so in many instances, studies have shown, there's a study that was carried out in the early 2000s that says in Africa, the majority of the people have not been touched by governments, they've not been touched by NGOs or by philanthropy itself, but actually how they have cohered their livelihoods has been through associations. So how do these associations do this? So the first aspect is co-production. The co-production is a, a concept that was made famous by Elino Ostrom when she was talking about the commons, et cetera, et cetera, to say, if we really look at the majority of our people in Africa, we live in what we may call the common, common spaces. And common spaces are self-regulated. They are associations within those commons. And it is those commons that actually begin sort of generate livelihoods. But in many instances, if you're an outsider, you will not understand what is deep within those communities. So the co-production is about the creation of value uh, out of co common goods. So you're creating value, you're beginning to say, we need to manage our grazing lands better. We need to manage uh, our water resources better. We need to do this. So bring that to the urban areas, because people may think I'm just talking about rural areas. Bring that to the urban areas, you begin to say, we have a challenge in our community around security. So we begin to come together and say, how do we make sure that we can achieve or we can ensure that our neighborhoods are safe? So as communities, we come together, maybe we establish residence associations neighborhood associations. But the co-production part is when we are doing that as a community, but also when we begin to work with official organs of the state. So we begin to work with the police. We now police our neighborhoods together with the official police. So we do not leave that responsibility to say, oh, it's the job of the police. Because we understand governments all over the world are stretched. They are strained. They do not have adequate budgets. So communities come to help with that. So the next one is co-creation. 
the co-creation part is when, and this is when you assume that there is a willingness on the part of governments to engage in what we call participatory democracy. Because when you are doing participatory democracy, especially in Zimbabwe where you are talking about devolution, you are assuming that the devolution that we're discussing is just not about moving resources from the center to locals, but you are also assuming that the locals are being given autonomy to discuss issues. So when they're discussing, is discussing issues as communities together with their local local authorities, municipalities, uh, and other authorities, they actually engage in a process of co-creating solutions. They, we actually begin to say that knowledge does not belong with the experts that are coming, maybe the city treasurer, the city planner, or the environment, or the engineer, but we are beginning to say some knowledge actually is within community. So co-creation can only happen in an environment of trust, but where there's participatory democracy. At the moment, it is a challenge, but it's some, it's, Maybe that's what you can call a utopia for me, mm -hmm. to say something that we are hoping we can begin to see happening when we begin to see local authorities coming, not to tell us what to do, but coming to say, we seek your, your understanding of the problem, sort of how you name the problem and how you frame solutions together. That's the core creation part. Then you're talking about uh, collective problem solving. So. In many instances, like I've already said, what we are seeing, many studies are showing this, governments are ill-equipped mm -hmm. to deal with many problems. The problems of policy, we call them wicked problems. These are problems that are difficult to define in terms of their origins, to say, how did this problem emerge in a community? Uh, so at times we discuss symptoms as if we're discussing the problem, uh, the source of the problem. So what we need then is to begin to say, how do we come together to name, to identify and to name the problem properly. That normally happens when communities are engaged and they are working with local authorities or even with the national government. But the collective partner of problem solving, in many instances, what we have seen is, uh, especially in Zimbabwe and many other African countries, there's a new way of doing things where we are good now at naming problems. So we name all the problems eloquently, then we hand over our problems to local authorities. But when we talk about collective problem solving, is to begin to say, from an asset-based mindset, is to begin to say, how can we work together? How can we make sure that we are resolving these problems together? Because that is really the challenge, to begin to think that all the problems are to be fixed by government, and that communities, all they have to do is to wait. So we have a saying at Severe Institute, which is very interesting. We say, politicians promise, citizens expect, and nothing happens in between. But our utopia is to begin to say, how do we create that space where there can be actually an acknowledgement of, by both parties that on our own, in our silos, we're not able to really resolve the problems we face. But if we come together, there's a synergy that is created, which is not one plus one is equals to two, but one plus one is equals to three. You are beginning to create energy and you are beginning to enable and, and engender trust in how we work together. I love how you've explained um, one aspect of the blog where you wrote that democracy is not an event, but it is a culture. And from what you're saying, I'm picking up the day-to-day -day engagement of communities and their leaders to create an environment that caters for both. There's one aspect that you had left out, which is citizen engaged, citizens engaged in the public space. What does that look like when you say citizens are engaged in the public space? Okay, that's a good one. So I think the... I think let's go back first to the, to the court you make reference to say democracy is not an event. Because in many instances when we say, oh, we study democracy, people assume that we're studying elections. But we rarely do elections work at CVO. It's only now that we've gradually been sort of pulled into that space. But normally for us, democracy is, in simple ways, is what citizens do with each other, what citizens do for each other. Because we acknowledge that even office holders, at some point, they're citizens. So we are in a republic. A republic is made up of citizens. And uh, as, a citi as a citizen, we come together and we elect office holders to represent us from different areas, to begin, to, because we're trying to short circuit a system to say that direct democracy will be very difficult for us to say, for every decision that has to be made, all of us have to sit in a referendum. So we elect people we trust to represent us. But the challenge that we have made is, 
we have made it to sound like once we have done that part, we have, we have we were complete with our, the task. So I think it has also been a shift in terms of how we have emphasized citizen education in the public space. In the early 80s when we got independence, I think some of you guys were not yet born, when we got our independence, there was emphasis on civic education. And there were so many other, so there were terms like Vugu Zenzele, promoted by ORAP, a Matebeleland and Midlands based, based NGO, led by uh, now the Minister of Industry and Commerce, um, Honorable Stembi Sonyoni. But if you look at that, if you look at ORAP, what it was trying to promote, it was trying to promote active citizenship in responding to problems that we're facing. But the challenge is, at the moment, we've reduced citizen agency to voting. So we also have a saying at Severe Institute where we say, elections are a necessary but not sufficient condition for democracy. So in a non-election year like this one, uh, we've just come out of an election, there are some who are not happy with the result, there are others who are celebrating the result. We've got five more years. What are we going to be doing? Are we going to wait again for 2028? Or there are things that we can do. There are many things that we're doing. So that's when we're saying citizens engaged in public work, in public decision making. It includes uh, the work that we do to improve our communities. It includes the work that we do when we come together as citizens and we're not happy with what office holders are doing. We try to hold them accountable. It includes even holding protests. But that's not the only thing we do. It also also includes us coming up with solutions to certain problems that I call community-based, community-level problems that can be fixed within the community. Our challenge is, honestly, we've given, we've given over our power to elected uh, bodies and we've forgotten about our own agency. So that is the challenge. So we are now playing a game where we've reduced democracy to this ritual to say every five years, for five minutes you have power, you are going to vote somebody, then after that you wait. But if we've learned anything in the past 40 or so years of this so-called democracy in Zimbabwe, is that that model has failed. So we really need to rethink. So when you say let's rethink democracy, people are saying maybe we're talking about political parties. I couldn't, I couldn't care less about who's in a political party, about who's leading a political party, because they are all leading in a vacuum. It's the, the real challenge is citizens who are not mobilized, citizens who have no sense of what they actually want. They are waiting for office holders to explain the agenda going forward, when it should be the other way around. Citizens should be the one who are shaping the agenda for the country. Citizens should be the one who are demanding an, a certain inclusive framework of development. Citizens should be the ones who are knocking on the doors saying we want to participate, nothing without, nothing for us without us. But at the moment, we've reduced this, and it comes from a very deep cultural mindset of chefuism, or I call it an elitocracy, where we really have reduced democracy to say certain people know better than us, so they will do things for us. That's like an expert cult, where we just think experts know it all. But the challenges we're facing in Zimbabwe, somebody from the streets can actually tell you solutions. But it's just that we don't value citizen-based knowledge generation. That kind of knowledge, those kinds of ways of thinking, we're not yet valuing them. But for us to really rescue the democracy that we want in Zimbabwe and begin to chart a more inclusive path, we have to come together again as citizens, starting with these looking, these platforms that look very innocent, as if they have no role in society, but they're very important. The associational forms of 10 to 12 people, of 20, of 100, we see them all over, but I don't think they understand their power. And I don't think they are really mobilized to do the work that they set out to do. So many, in many instances, our challenge is that we've just deferred, we've just like, we have this messianic approach to politics to think that there's a Moses who's coming to take us out of this land of oppression into the promised land. What if Moses doesn't come? I think that was a beautiful way to end that explanation. My question would then be, we have painted this picture of a utopic community we've kind of broken down where we are um, as communities. How do we move from where we are to this engaged communities that contributes to inclusive democracy? Yeah, that's a lot of work. And we are globally and with like-minded organizations that we're working with, it's something that we are so concerned about. Because on the one hand, we're very concerned about not trying to also make it a top-down approach to say, 
establish an association, run your association this way, build this way. So what we've done, especially for us at Civil Institute, is to begin to look at what we may call bright spots, the shoots, the shoots of democracy. These associations, for us, these are the green shoots. These are the shoots that are promising that something can, can emerge. So our mapping through the Center for Philanthropy and Communities has led us to identify a number of associational platforms that, are either, that either see themselves as philanthropy-focused organizations, but based on solidarity, based on mobilizing resources from the community. Because we've always talked about that if we're going to rescue and to reshape the narrative around Zimbabwe's development, it has to be from an assets-based framework. It has to be based on us understanding that we have within ourselves, within ourselves, sufficient resources to move the needle on a number of issues. So I think we're beginning to get sort of a nascent movement around that. We've just launched our Women and Youth Activist School. And these activists that we have identified and invited to be part of this are people who are working within communities, are people that were thinking that they can be the, the catalyst, catalytic agents uh, for the change that we need. But this is not a silver bullet. This is not work that happens overnight. This is work that happens over time. When we begin to say, we need to understand that the change we want can only be brought about by us working collectively together. So at the moment, the challenge we have is uh, it's a mindset issue in Zimbabwe. Our mindsets are based on, uh, uh, so we have two challenges we deal with. We have the toxic polarization. Mm -hmm. So even this conversation, somebody may want to try to pin us down to a certain political party, to say which party do we belong to. Uh, if, if I make the mistake, for instance, of talking about citizens, people will think of the political formation that calls itself by that name. Mm -hmm. But we're talking generally about us who live in Zimbabwe, all of us are citizens. So that's number one, that toxic polarization. Point number two is uh, there's something that has happened in Zimbabwe. Uh, in the 1990s, studies showed that uh, one in every four Zimbabweans belong to an association, one in every four households, especially rural households. But when we carried out a study in 2020, uh, comparing Zimbabwe against four other countries, Cameroon, Kenya, Ghana, and Malawi, we actually found that associational life is lower in Zimbabwe compared to those countries. So we've been trying to sort of understand and unpack that, why is it that way? Then I think one of the things that has hit us is the, the economic crisis. The economic crisis that we've had has led us maybe to think in a more insular way, uh, to think inside and, to, and less around our neighbors, etc. And also there's been huge migration. Uh, so societies are disrupted uh, because the associations that we understudy were never formed like a political party that is formed in another city and you are mobilized to it. Associations normally come from within that environment. But the migration that we talk about is broken societies. So the question that you ask to say what needs to be done is to begin to say how do we rethink communities? How do we begin to say, how do we foster ties of trust, solidarity, and the idea of community? That's number one. But number two, what has changed? Technology. Technology has changed massively. So if you're talking of uh, millennials, Generation X, and Gen Zs, etc., you actually have to think about where do they gather? They are gathering mostly on uh, technology platforms, WhatsApp, Telegram, and many others, or even Facebook. So when you begin to think about associations, you should not be limited to the face-to-face -face interactions, but you should also think about how technology enables associations. There are many youngsters who tell you that I belong to my former school uh, association, I belong to this, I belong to a football club, supporters group, etc. All those are associations. Then the question you're asking is to say, how can these associations contribute towards better conversations about power, about democracy, about our shared spaces. How do they collectively contribute towards aiding in restoring the idea of civic agency and citizenship? So for us, like I said, there are bright shoes that we're looking at. We want to build upon those so that we make this a message, a, a dominant message to say, democracy is not just about political parties. Democracy is about citizens coming together to fix public problems, starting with the things that are happening at a local level. There's a saying that smart no tangira kutsoka, 
Well, I always convert that and I say democracy no Tangira Kutsoka. So democracy starts at a very local level. In those associations, associations provide incubation for leadership, those who are going to lead us in the future. They learn a lot of leadership skills within those voluntary platforms. But also, associations lead towards people thinking more about debating, you know, learning how to debate, learning how to promote the ideas, etc., etc. And number three, they actually lead to real solidarity. I've had so many instances of brothers saying, oh, we used to play social soccer together, and then we just realized, you know what, we're spending a lot of time together as a band of brothers, and we realized we all come from communal areas. And one of our friends said, oh, the school he went to has just been hit by a flood. So they said, what, what if we came together, mobilized resources, and did that? So for me, when I look at what people call a boozers club, and they just think it's a time-wasting thing, but I actually think it's a place where solidarity is being cohered brotherhood is being developed so that they can begin to think of other avenues of using the synergy they have created there. So there are quite a number of these stories that we've come across. I've come across a group that of doctors that are based in uh, Australia and all of them coming from Mwenez in Berengwa area and beginning to say, we're going to build a hospital where we come from. But it starts from just an association, just to hang out. And I've seen groups coming together saying, we're a book reading club. We just want to read books. Then before you know you're saying, but guys, as we're reading books, there are actually some kids who do not have books in their schools. What if we begin to collect books and send to those libraries? So in many instances, the origin of the association does not determine the work it's going to do, but it's just the beginning. It's just the building block around it. Right. I love how you've explained the idea of engaged communities within the 21st century. The last couple of sentences that you said describe what we can do as individuals because as a millennial when i think of associations i think of you know formal sitting down we have a constitution this is what we do we're paying our subscriptions but for me who's living in town or in the avenues i'm thinking i don't belong to an association but when you describe it that way it's all of us can belong to an association it's not really about the formalization of it it's just about the elements of trust the elements of moving towards a particular vision that we've all drawn together. So how do we then measure the effectiveness of community engagement in advancing principles of inclusive democracy? It, so the agenda we're putting on the table is not a silver bullet, nor does it take, is it an overnight process. Uh, it's something that we're saying when we really look at, uh, so there's a classic that I always refer people to, Democracy One and Democracy Two, by Alex uh, Tocqueville. Uh, this is a Frenchman who goes to study democracy in America. But he, he writes about democracy in America in those two volumes in a very interesting way. Because for him, what he notices is associational life. He notices associational life that gives birth to many institutions, but also resolves many problems to do with health and education. So even if you were to go to the United States right now, and you look at how associations have led to the establishment of hospitals, establishment of schools, etc., and at that particular time, some of these associations had a religious bent to them, you see? So that's what kept them together. But when you come back to, when you come back to your question to say, in the 21st century, how do we measure this? For many people have said that had it not been for the solidarity in Zimbabwe, the economic crisis would have hit deeper, would have collapsed even faster. The collapse would have been rapid. But we do not know what has kept Zimbabwean society going. And some of us posit that it's associations, the solidarity networks that are within communities. So if you're not beginning to say, going forward, how do we do this? My utopia is that if we've empowered or engaged communities, they flip the power equation. Because it is those communities that begin to say, we are not going to elect so and so to go to office because he does or she does not represent us. If you look, for instance, uh, my case study around this is Blawayo. If you look at Blawayo, the number of ward councillors that are coming out of residence associations tells you something about the role of residence associations as being incubators for leaders, as training ground, but also speaking to the fact that residence associations now have leverage in terms of who they are seconding and deploying to be uh, in, in, a, in council. So that's 
in itself is a measure. But I think the most important part is to, when you begin to measure democracy beyond just free and fair elections, you begin to measure it using other conditions to say the extent to which citizens are involved. We call that the national pulse. The citizens are engaged in solving public problems. Citizens are coming on board with own, their own innovations. Like now, I think it's going to be interesting in 2024. There is a pending drought in Southern Africa. And again, I'm putting my, best, my bet on communities themselves. That the most, what we're going to find as the most uh, interesting interventions, because we have learned this from uh, events such as uh, floods, etc., that first responders are rarely government or NGOs or philanthropy. First responders are usually the communities. So I'm putting my bet again to say we are going to see uh, innovations that are coming from communities responding to the crisis of food insecurity, if it has not already begun. It's just that we're not tracking it well. Yeah, Collective ways of saying, how do we look after the vulnerable within our communities? How do we make sure that orphans are fed? How do we make sure that our kids are at school during this crisis? Because it's not only a crisis of the drought, but it's also a crisis of jobs and well-being. Remember, the drought is coming on top of other crises that we're dealing with as a country. But my biggest bet is that, yes, government will come up with these in interventions, but I think the first responders are going to be communities. Right. So how would we describe sustainability of these associational forms in communities at the moment? I mean, there are clubs that come and go, just like political parties come and go. How do we make sure that there's some form of sustainability of these associations or engaged communities? Yeah, very valid, very valid point. I think the, the danger that they face, these associations, uh, is not necessarily sustainability, is actually what I may call the NGOization. You know, when they begin to behave like an NGO, when they begin to look for resources and they begin to implement projects, they are that big. Uh, and actually, it always looks like the best way around to say, ah, let's get funding, etc. But the challenge with funding, from my studies, what I have noticed, funding kills community agency. Uh, communities begin to think that there's somebody with more resources that can help us. That's not to say we don't need aid, but it's just to say that how we structure aid into communities can create new power, power dynamics, can also create levels of alienation and disengagement. So for us, it's we have to rethink how we bring these associations into aid circuits without destroying their original DNA. Because what we're talking about here is something that is slightly different from NGOs, is something that is uh, supported by its own members. It's something that members have been contributing towards. Because every time, even when I look at residents' associations that tap into donor funds, two, three years down the line, they're splitting. But it's not the residents that are splitting, it's the secretariats of these residents' associations, telling you that the problem is really residents, but those who have been given the mandate to run this. So I think we need to be very careful about uh, when you talk about sustainability, because normally the investments in a community in terms of structures and assets is normally very low. So that's what keeps them going because they have not, they have not been, we've not asked people to come and put in lots of money. So for instance, if you take what, for me, coming from a low income area in Blauayo, what keeps those communities going is something called Zibuteni. At any funeral, they are going to take, somebody is going to come up and take a, a cup of millimil from every house. And it is that millimil that is going to be used at that funeral. And for those who can't give millimil, they give a dollar. And that's the money that is then used to buy the protein that is needed there or for transportation. So that's an engaged community. Yeah. So can they do more? Yes, they can do more. But we do not want aid to come and begin to destroy this. Because what, they, what we begin to say is we insist on what you're talking about, the constitution, governance framework, etc. But the moment we do that, the more educated types are the ones who occupy those offices. And already we create layers within those associations. So they create a new dynamic. So for us is to begin to say, how do we make sure that as we are growing these new shoots, we grow them carefully without destroying them? Because aid is not necessarily benevolent. At times it can actually destroy what it's set out to establish. Well said. As we close or we come to a close, what are your thoughts in regards to what people can do as individuals to create engaged communities where they are? 
Yeah, so uh, like I said, it starts very local. Uh, there are many needs in every community. There are many needs, uh, high income, low income. We actually find that associations are very difficult to establish in high income areas because high income households tend to be very atomized, individualistic. But communities that are in the low and middle income areas, they tend to be more outward facing because they rely, they rely on each other uh, for their day-to-day -day survival. So there's nothing that they have resolved, they've sort of solved by themselves. They know that they need the community to solve public problems, or even individual problems, a funeral, a sickness in the home, etc. So for us, when you begin to look at this, we are, I am more positive or optimistic when I look at low-income areas. Uh, and these are even the establishment of low-income communities. Some of them actually come from associations, how we've begun to see uh, associations of building, people building together, uh, women coming together to say, we'll build your house first, then we'll build so-and-so's house, then we'll do this. Normally we'd see that. And then we're seeing also women, mostly in the diaspora, beginning to say, you know what, as an association, we've established a bus company. Uh, so we bought a bus for you, we bought a bus for the next person, etc. So these are what you may call roscas, rotating and savings uh, groups. But that keeps communities going because they're just not about buying buses. So if so-and-so falls into trouble, they help each other. So for me, it's to say, if we can rediscover solidarity at that level, it's easier for us to even begin to say, we cannot allow this portal uh, because we are waiting and we have reported it to council. How about if we fix it? So... For us, it's a, it's a yearning and a desire to say, how do we help communities or how do we see communities coming to work at some point alongside the state in, in a complementary manner to fix certain infrastructure issues that government is failing to do? Because normally I get this response to say, that's the work of government that you're recommending. But over the years, in many developed countries, what I have seen is countries that we say are developed actually have active citizens, engaged communities through associations, cooperatives that are actually producing public goods. So for us to, to fold our hands and expect office holders to do this work on their own, it's literally like uh, a pie in the sky. It's not going to happen anytime soon because we don't even have the methods of ensuring accountability. Because when we're engaged in the work, we know how much it costs, we can ask the right, right questions, etc. But the challenge we have in Zimbabwe right now is... Uh, our hands are folded, we're looking insular, we're looking inwards, we're not seeing ourselves as potentially the solution to the problems what we face, but we've allocated that responsibility to other individuals, either within government or within the opposition. I call that messianic politics. It has not taken us so too far since we got our independence. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Tendai, for an amazing discussion around engaged communities. My call to you would be, you can take responsibility for what is happening in your community, within your social spaces, with your friends, with your church. You can do something about the issues that you have. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you in the next episode.